ladies and gentlemen, this will be a talk on blistering disorders. We're going to cover two blistering disorders. Both are fairly rare. Uh, however, they are very commonly tested on the USMLE, especially USMLE Step 1. And the reason that is is because these are a couple disorders that really tie together histology, physiology, pathology, uh, pharmacology, and uh, of, of course uh, they are clinically relevant um, even though they're rare. Uh, so it's uh, also these two disorders are very similar uh, in presentation uh, and so USMLE likes to test these. They come up, they came up on my tests, they've come up on some practice tests that I've looked at. So I, I strongly recommend that you pay attention here. Also because we're going to make use of a lot of that histo, uh, histopathology, histology, I recommend that you go back, if you haven't already, and watch my Intro to Dermatology lectures where I go over the normal histology of the skin because you need to know what normal is like before you understand what abnormal is uh, because it really lays that foundation and um, you know, otherwise you're just memorizing pathology and that's never a good way to go about it. If you haven't had the opportunity yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash bwbmd. You can get there by clicking the link below in the description of the video or on the i button on the upper right hand corner up here and it should link you up. If you consider chipping in a dollar a month, a little bit goes a long way to help keep these videos free. If you subscribe, you'll have access to some premium content, which I go over case studies, formulating differential diagnosis, treatment plan, things that will come in handy for you as you prepare for step three, clinical case scenarios, as well as impressing your attendings on rounds, because attendings were always uh, really excited when <laughs> medical students and residents have a good formulaic way about going about patient care. Uh, so uh, thank you very much in advance for your consideration. So we're going to talk about two blistering skin disorders, pemphigus vulgaris and bullous pemphigoid. Uh, we'll briefly talk about traumatic blisters, certainly the most common cause of blisters. Uh, there are some other disorders that involve blisters, but they uh, are going to be covered in future lectures because they are fairly unique in and of themselves, and I just think that they'll, they'll be better uh, covered under different categories. So blistering skin disorders involve blisters and the medical name for a blister is a bulla, plural bulle. It's due to a loss of cohesion either within a layer of the epidermis or between layers of the skin, namely between the dermis and epidermis. Um, and this results in a filling of the potential space with fluid. Remember that bullae are greater than one centimeter in diameter, whereas vesicles are the same exact pathologic process, they're just less than one centimeter in diameter. So this, those are uh, some naming conventions. Uh, bullae are going to be things that we're going to talk about here. Vesicles are what you would see in like herpes, for instance. Bullae are commonly subdivided into the location of separation. So we have epidermal and subepidermal blisters. Epidermal blisters are due to separation of the layers within the dermis. These blisters, for that reason, because they have a thinner top, they're going to be flaccid and more fragile. Whereas subepidermal blisters are due to separation of the epidermis and the dermis at the basement membrane. And so because they have a thicker roof to the, the top of them, a thicker dome, you can think of it, these bullae are tense and stronger. Blisters can be due to autoimmune conditions, as we're going to talk about here, or they could be related to physical forces like trauma and friction and heat, uh, burns, uh, and so forth. One of the chief concerns of blisters is the possibility of secondary infection. That's why it's so important to treat. Nikolsky sign is something you should be aware of. I go over it in that Intro to Dermatology talk. And Nikolsky sign is basically you take the blister, you rub along the side of it, and you see if you can grow the blister. And if you have an epidermal blister, because it's so fragile, uh, you're going to be able to grow the blister. But if you have a subepidermal blister, because they're a lot more stable and strong, you're not going to be able to grow the blister. If you can grow the blister, that's called Nikolsky positive. And if you can't, it's Nikolsky negative. And that helps you distinguish epidermal blisters from subepidermal blisters. So this is uh, a cartoon of the skin. 
denoting the epithelial cell junctions. The two we're really concerned about for this talk are the desmosomes, which link keratinocytes, and the hemidesmosome, which links keratinocytes to the basement membrane. Pemphigus vulgaris is the most common variant of pemphigus. There's a lot of different types of pemphigus, but pemphigus vulgaris is the most common type, but it's not very common overall. It's due to infiltration of IgG, immunoglobulin G, into the epidermis, which targets desmosomes that link keratinocytes. And so because it targets desmosomes, destroys the desmosomes, the keratinocytes are going to separate and you're going to have a loss of cohesion. We call that loss of cohesion acantholysis or acantholysis, however you want to pronounce it. The precise protein that's targeted in the desmosomes is desmogli desmoglein 1 or desmoglein 3. You'll want to know this if you're taking step 1. If you're taking step 2 or 3, it's really not relevant information. As I said, it's rare, about 1 to 10 per 100,000, but it's much more common in individuals of Jewish, Middle Eastern, and Mediterranean descent. As a matter of fact, I read somewhere that the, the uh, prevalence in Jerusalem is actually 100 per 100,000, so uh, quite a significant difference. The incidence obviously then varies by region. Most cases are diagnosed in middle age. Clinical presentation are painful flaccid blisters of the mucous membrane and the skin. And typically when you see this, it's going to start in the mouth and then it will uh, start to occur elsewhere on the body. Uh, it's typically widespread at, uh, at, at the later stages and more progressed stages of the disease. The palms and soles are usually spared and that's an important distinction from the next disease we're going to talk about, some of the other diseases. Because the blisters are fragile, a lot of times when you see it, it's just going to look like erosions. It's not going to look like blisters. The blisters will have already popped, and, uh, and so it'll be more of an erosion in appearance, but you may see some blisters too. Gross appearance, you have painful, flaccid blisters of the mucous membrane and skin. Usually they're eroded. The erosions can coincide with the blisters. If you do see the blisters, you'll want to do a Nikolsky test, and they'll be Nikolsky positive. So this is an example of pemphigus vulgaris on the uh, mucous membrane of the mouth. Um, notice that this is eroded, so you don't see the blister. And it's very easy for these blisters to erode because there's a lot of friction in the mouth and uh, you know the teeth can rub up against it. And remember, they're very weak blisters. This is an intact blister on the tongue. This is a really big blister here. So here you can see some uh, blisters, most of them are eroded and then they crust over because they are a wound. And you can see here that it can spread uh, to the trunk. So uh, again, you don't really see any uh, current blisters, um, but you'll want to look for one because that's where you're going to biopsy. You want to biopsy on the blister. Okay. So here you do actually see some blisters. And notice that, uh, that you have different stages of healing. So you've got some eroded blisters, you've got active blisters. Uh, some can be filled with serum, others uh, can have more of a bloody uh, uh, filling to them. Or at least uh, what you see underneath the blister is, is uh, red tissue. The microscopic findings, you'll see a suprabasilar cleft with acantholysis and tombstoning of the basal keratinocytes. I'm going to show you a picture of that, of course. Uh, you may also see dermal inflammatory cell infiltrate with eosinophils. Remember, those are those pink uh, white blood cells. Direct immunofluorescence is really important to understand because the USMLE likes to show you this one. Uh, they'll show you a picture of this and they'll ask you in the answer choices, pemphigus vulgaris and bullus pemphigus will be two answer choices. You'll need to know how to distinguish them. You'll see IgG and C3 deposits in the pattern of a broad linear net-like band. And of course, it's going to be in the epidermal layer because this targets desmosomes of the keratinocytes. Okay, so this is that tombstoning. It's just basically uh, basal cells. Uh, and uh, notice that you have here your, your blister cavity. Uh, notice that the basement membrane is intact. That's this sort of fuchsia-like line underneath these basal cells, the stratum basale. Remember, the stratum basale is just one layer thick. You don't see much inflammatory 
uh, exit date here. Okay, again, you see here that the, uh, the basal layer is intact, the basement membrane is intact. Uh, you have what are called here uh, acanthocytes. That's just cells that have uh, cleaved away from each other. Keratinocytes have cleaved away from each other uh, due to the loss of, uh, of connective integrity. Um, and notice that this might be an eosinophil here or a red blood cell. I can't really tell. This is that tombstoning again. All the tombstoning is, uh, what it means is that you see basal cells detached from the rest of the epidermis. So they look like tombs, because remember they're kind of, uh, the, the cells of the stratum basale are kind of uh, columnar in shape. Again, notice the basement membrane is intact. That's this kind of pinkish fuchsia layer underneath the stratum basale. This is immunofluorescence. So uh, immunofluorescence, if it stains positive, it's going to be a, a lighter neon green color, uh, whereas the negative area is gonna be a darker green color. Uh, so notice that it's a very thick layer corresponding with uh, keratinocytes. Um, and that was that is what yields this net-like pattern. And I'm going to show you when we go on to bolus pemphigoid, it's a very different pattern. Then I'll show you a picture of the two uh, together, so you'll be able to appreciate the difference. Again, here you can appreciate that fish uh, net-like pattern and a very broad uh, band. The diagnosis is by biopsy, which you can look just with H&E stain, as we saw, or you can do immunofluorescence, or you can do both. It's usually done with both. Remember, you're looking for IgG and C3. That's important that you know that this is IgG-mediated, and remember that that's a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. They may ask you that, too. The differential diagnosis is bolus pemphigoid. Bullous pemphigoid, as we're going to see, is Nikolsky negative. The blisters are often stronger, so you're more likely to see more blisters and fewer er erosions, relatively speaking, on presentation. With bullous pemphigoid, they tend to be pruritic, whereas with pemphigus vulgaris, they tend to be really painful. Uh, with bullous pemphigoid, you're less likely to see ulcers on the mucous membranes. If you do, you're only going to see it in the mouth. You're not going to see it in the esophagus or anything uh, anywhere like that. Microscopic evaluation for bolus pemphigoid is going to show separation from the uh, between the epidermis and the dermis of that basement membrane. Erythema multiforme slash Stephen Johnson syndrome slash toxic epidermal necrolysis uh, usually presents on the palms and soles, whereas pemphigus vulgaris spares the palms and soles. There will also be some connection to either a recent infection, namely herpes simplex or mycoplasma pneumonia, or the commencement of medication, and they'll either uh, give you probably one of these three, either phenytoin, sulfas, or allopurinol. Aphthous stomatitis is just a canker sore. These are confined to the oral region. They're painful, but they're self-limited, so they're very isolated uh, lesions. The treatment for pemphigus vulgaris is corticosteroids, typically oral prednisone. If the patient needs to be on it long term, we try to put them then on immunomodulators because you don't want to have somebody on corticosteroids long term because of the side effects, weight gain, uh, osteoporosis, stuff like that. Uh, so immunomodulators would be things like mycophenolate. However, I've read that rituximab can be used as well. Topical lidocaine can be given for pain. Okay, bolus pemphigoid is a chronic acquired autoimmune blistering disease, so it's very similar in that respect to uh, pemphigus vulgaris. Uh, it's also characterized by IgG autoantibodies. However, these autoantibodies target the hemidesmosomes. Remember, the hemidesmosomes are what attach the uh, stratum basale cells to the basement membrane. And so this results in the formation of a subepidermal blister. The epidermis will be intact. You won't have acanthocytes. But what you will have is a separation at the basement membrane. And the result of this is what's known as pemphigoid, which is a separation of the epidermis from the dermis at the basement membrane. Epidemiology, this is the most common autoimmune blistering disease in adults, but it's still pretty rare overall. And it usually happens when it does happen in older people, 70s and 80s. The clinical presentation is tense, fluid-filled, pruritic blisters, and I probably should have bold-faced tense. These are tense, strong blisters. Usually they're just on the skin, not on the mucous membrane, but in about 10 to 30 percent of cases they are uh, on, on the mucous membranes as well. A lot of times it's preceded by a pruritic prodrome, so you'll have healthy-looking skin, it'll itch, and then these blisters will develop.
And that's, again, probably mediated by the initial uh, inflammatory infiltrate that happens uh, prior to the actual separation of the layers. These are Nikolsky negative. You can't grow these. And the blisters may be filled with serous fluid or later blood. And that's why when you look at these blisters, some of them look yellow and some of them look red. The gross appearance are tense fluid filled blisters on the skin. They may vary in color depending on the contents of the blister and erosions will be present in places where the blisters have worn off. They may be generalized or they could be limited to one area like a single limb and that's in contrast to uh, Pemphigus vulgaris. So you notice here serous filled blisters as well as some areas of erosion where the blisters once were. All right, so you see these really tense bullet here. Here you see some blisters in the later stages. Uh, they tend to start out with serous fluid and then uh, they start to fill up with blood and then they erode. So you, you can see here some blood blisters as well as some serous filled blisters. Microscopic appearance. The big difference is that you'll have separation of the epidermis from the underlying dermis at the basement membrane. The dermis may also be edematous, and the blister cavity and dermis can also be infiltrated here with eosinophils. With direct immunofluorescence, it will also reveal IgG and C3 deposits. However, in this case, you'll have a very narrow linear pattern at the epidermal aspect of the basement membrane. So you won't have fish netting, you'll just have a little line going across and you'll see, you'll see the entire epidermis is completely intact. So this is a, 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 low, low, a low magnification view of, of bolus pemphigoid. Uh, notice that the entire epidermis is intact. You have a pretty big infiltration, uh, inflammatory infiltration of the dermis. You don't see a whole lot of edema. Here you can see eosinophils. This is you're just looking at dermis here. Uh, you see some uh, some edema with some space in between uh, the the fibers. Um, notice also uh, where was it down here. Uh, around the ar arterioles, you're going to see uh, some periarticular uh, inflammatory exudate. Uh, but notice you see eosinophils. Uh, uh, so right here, this is a good example, you see some uh, periarticular uh, infiltrate. Um, you see infiltration elsewhere in the dermis, but you notice again the separation is at the level of the basement membrane. Notice here are your stratum basale cells and everything above that is completely intact. Again here you can see some eosinophils uh, infiltrating uh, in, in this case into the, uh, the, the blister cavity. Here's immunofluorescence. So notice how it's different here. You just see a very thin line. The epidermis is intact. You don't see any of that fish netting. So here's Pemphigus vulgaris. You see fish netting here because the, the antibodies are in uh, and around the keratinocytes. Uh, whereas here, you only see it at the basement membrane. The diagnosis for bullous pemphigoid is the exact same way we go about diagnosing uh, pemphigus vulgaris, and that's a biopsy of a fresh lesion. It's not going to help you if, you if you do a biopsy of an erosion. You need to do it at a blister. Immunofluorescence is helpful again. The differential diagnosis is the same as pemphigus vulgaris, all the different things that can cause blistering, and the treatment is pretty much the same as pemphigus vulgaris as well. The mainstay of treatment is corticosteroids. Immunomodulators can be used for steroid sparing and antihistamines can be used for the itching that often occurs with bolus pemphigoid. Traumatic blisters, we're not going to spend too much time on. They're pretty fairly easy to diagnose. Um, these are just isolated blisters that may occur from a variety of forces, usually from shearing forces. Uh, they can also be due to exposure to chemical like poison ivy and nickel, or they can be due to burns. Uh, differentiating tra uh, traumatic blisters from blistering disorders is based on clinical history. Uh, pretty easy. I mean, they're in isolation, or a patient may say, I was walking in the woods, or I was trying to open a container. Uh, I was trying to uh, 
about uh, a week and a half ago, I was trying to climb up uh, Machu Picchu, uh, the, the mountain where Machu Picchu is, and uh, I was using a walking stick, and I blistered my finger uh, from, uh, well, more of a hiking stick, I guess, uh, but I was holding onto it so tightly that I, I blistered my finger. I had a pretty nasty blood blister. So these can happen pretty easily. They can be serous or blood-filled, and it's a clinical diagnosis. We don't really need to do anything for this. You don't need to use steroids or anything, just symptomatic management. Keep the area clean to prevent infection. If, you, if, if there is pain, and a lot of times there are, my blister kept me up at night, it was so bad. Um, just NSAIDs, uh, anti-inflammatories, that's all you need to do. But really keep the area clean to prevent infection because that's one of the complications that can come from blisters, especially once they erode, is you can get a secondary infection. So just to recap, pemphigus vulgaris and bolus pemphigoid are both blistering disorders that result from IgG-mediated infiltration targeting cell adhesion molecules. With pemphigus vulgaris, it targets desmosomes. With bolus pemphigoid, it targets hemidesmosomes. Nikolsky sign is a useful clinical differentiator between the two disorders. Pemphigus vulgaris is Nikolsky positive, bolus pemphigoid is Nikolsky negative. The diagnosis is made by a biopsy of the lesion as well as immunofluorescence, which is looking for IgG and C3. Please remember that. Pemphigus vulgaris will show acantholysis within the epidermis, tombstoning, and broad fish netting on immunofluorescence, whereas bolus pemphigoid will show separation at the basement membrane, dermal infiltration, and edema, as well as narrow linear staining on immunofluorescence. And the treatment is first with corticosteroids, uh, immunomodulators can be used for steroid sparing, and then symptomatic treatment as needed. And that's all I've got for you. If you have any questions, please write me a note below. Otherwise, I will see you next time.